Hey, we got the best opener in KPFA, I tell you what. Welcome to Pushing Limits, a program by and about folks living with disability. I'm Shelley Berman here with Adrian Lobby. For the last three years and four months, I've been bobbing and weaving, trying to outfox and outmaneuver COVID-19. I'm a caregiver, and heck, if I was going to kill one of my clients or my elderly mother or my brother with comorbidities or anybody, it was my biggest fear. I might do something unsafe and bring the virus into someone's home and kill them. I was so careful. I was so stressed. I was so shut down from life. Then, this last March, I decided to go to a conference to deal with my stressful thinking. I hoped it would bring me peace. Instead, it brought me raging war because all I could think about was the invisible COVID in the room. I couldn't relax. I couldn't let myself be mask-free. Mother Nature was was sure not interested in helping. She was sending atmospheric rivers one after the other and keeping all 300 of us inside and in close proximity. I didn't catch COVID, but I sure got sick and had a raging sinus infection. COVID had its way with the attendees and many caught it. I was out for two weeks with a doggone sinus infection, but Take that, COVID. You did not get me. May brought my nephew's bar mitzvah, and again, COVID was in the house, and I escaped with another sinus infection. Clearly, my immune system suffered after three years and four months of isolation. Two courses of antibiotics in two months. Another incident with a poisonous being, a tick or a spider biting me in the belly, and three months, and three courses of antibiotics. Aside from all that, this has been a really tough year for me. Two clients died, my oldest sister died, my sister-in-law died, and my brother-in-law died. So when I heard that my brother's in-law died, I offered to go to the funeral with him last week. I wanted to support him. I didn't want him to be alone. He just lost his wife. I went. What could happen at a funeral? It happened. I caught COVID at the funeral of my brother-in-law's, my brother's brother-in-law. My nightmare was here, and the even bigger nightmare of giving it to Adrian happened too. What do you do, Paxlovid? How do you find out? If you have Kaiser like I do, you get no support. I found out that I don't qualify for Paxlovid because Kaiser thinks I'm too young and too healthy. I would like to dropkick Kaiser into the trash bin. If I had a choice, I would leave them in a heartbeat. If my heart is still beating, and it appears to be, I think I dodged a bullet. Is it because of the vaccinations and the boosters? Is COVID just a bad flu? Have you got it right now? Are you a first timer? Nobody else at that funeral caught COVID. Was it just my time? I know Mr. Yusan was embalmed and didn't die of COVID, so he didn't give it to me. What the heck? Here's Adrian. So I've been doing Pushing Limits Radio for a decade or more. And this is the first time I've done it when I was sick. But it's an experiment, right? It's live radio. And it's been a trip to have COVID. Like Shelly, I dodged it for three years. And now 
it's like, here it is. What is it? Is it going to... I ended up in the emergency room. Well, my lungs look pretty good. Well, then two days later, oh, there it is in my lungs. And I'm back to doing a lot of heavy medication. And is it going to keep me out of the hospital? And uh, Paxlovid, yeah. And quarantining and how long it's easier and harder and all those three years of fears have just metabolized inside of me and I have been afraid of dying and maybe I'm not going to do that so that's exciting but today we want to talk to other people with disabilities we just shared our little story now we want to hear yours what's happened to you through these years of pandemic what's going on with you now are you someone who has long COVID? Are you someone who is afraid to get on public transit? We want to talk and really hear what disabled people are living through as everyone else is thinking the pandemic is winding down. Over. Or over, or done, <laughs> or neat. Here is the number to call. 510-848-4425. Five one zero eight four eight four four two five, and I want to tell you because um, I do know a little bit of some people who have long COVID, and some of you I know have been able-bodied. You know, this is this is your first experience with suddenly I need a chair, take a shower. Suddenly I need someone to keep me steady as I get out of bed. These are really frightening and difficult times. And I was there. Now, it's been many decades, but I remember it because it was a nightmare. And the support I got in a, in a support group that was with disabled people who had been disabled from birth, this is where I learned how to take care of myself. This is where I learned not to die. And uh, I really, really encourage you if you have long COVID and it's your first major disability, get in touch with some disabled people who can help you through it. It'll, it'll make a huge difference. And I also have a really good resource for everyone with long COVID, which is um, the Long COVID Justice, longcovidjustice.org. This is uh, run by J.D. Davids and Gabriel San Inventario. And they have a great staff and uh, advisor group. And let me just read a little bit about what they say. COVID-19, like many pandemic viruses, including polio and HIV, leads to disability and chronic disease. COVID-19 survivors worldwide are living with de debilitating, life-changing effects of long COVID. As complex as it can be, long COVID is just the most recent manifestation of a long, under-acknowledged phenomena of post-infection illness that often drives, worsens, or unmasks a set of understudied, complex chronic conditions. In other words, long COVID is, is just the same manifestation as we've had with polio with other pandemics. People end up sick when they're finished with when the rest of us are finished with our pandemic. They say, we honor the lineage and power of the disability justice movement, named and shaped by disabled and chronically ill black and brown LGBTQ people, which recognizes that it takes more than theoretical legal rights to in overcome entrenched ableism, racism, gender bias, and the drive for profits. Now these folks, I just have huge respect for them. They recognize that when the media talks about long COVID, which is not that often, they usually interview white, young, and previously healthy people. Now that's obviously a biased take on the reality of the disease. So this longcovidjustice.org, they're seeking really deep and meaningful change in how we see disability, not just this specific uh, incarnation called long COVID. On June 27th, they put out a call for discussion and planning for some direct action. So here's a bit of what they said about that. Direct action efforts can and should sp span a range of access needs. 
we've helped to develop a spectrum of tactics that deepen collaboration between those who can be on site and others who can help from a distance or from our beds. These people are really thinking it out. And you can find them at longcovidjustice.org. Let me give you the number to call in and be part of this conversation. 510-848-4425. And we do have a caller here. Um, Tati, I hope I'm pronouncing your name. Tati from Berkeley. Welcome to Pushing Wings. Yeah. Oh, my God, thanks for um, taking my call. Um, I just want to keep it short and simple. Um, around February of last year, I got COVID, and um, I was staying with a family member. We tried to quarantine as much as possible, um, but eventually my family member ended up getting COVID for me and now has long COVID. And um, she already had a pre-existing medical condition, but uh, the progression of her health has just gotten worse and worse. And... I can empathize with the guilt and the, the, the fear of walking around and wondering if I'm who a healthy person is going to give somebody COVID that has already had a compromised um, immune system. And um, I just never really understood COVID and I still don't understand COVID, but the fear and anxiety is still, is still there. But I do want to say that for anybody that has long COVID or COVID or has experienced it, that taking care of yourself really is the beginning of how we as a people, you know, live longer and not just through Western medicine, but, you know, any type of remedies or just taking care of ourselves. So that's what I really want to promote is trying to take care of ourselves as much as possible, drinking water and just trying to live a healthy lifestyle. Thank you so much for that, Tati. It's, um, yeah, when I realized I had it, um, I re I tried to isolate myself right away and shut my door and put on my mask and I was sanitizing and and doing everything I could to try to keep the others safe in this house and it turned out I didn't do enough or I couldn't do enough and and for this pandemic to be over. And for, it seems like many, 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 I've heard many first timers are getting it in just this week, I've heard about it. So it's not over and we do the best we can and, um, and congratulations to you for having a heart and for, for noticing, uh, I think that's that's amazing, and that's the best thing we can do. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's go on to Thomas in Arizona. Welcome to Pushing Limits, Thomas. Want to tell us a little bit about your disability and, and your experience with COVID? Uh, okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm glad I could catch this program because I rarely have this in my schedule for the day on Friday. Um, I'm an African-American senior, I'm 65, and um, I've got uh, osteoarthritis. As, the, I, I under, as I understand it, that is a, uh, what do you call it, an autoimmune deficiency condition, um, even though I don't feel like it's that for me. Uh, I'm youthful oriented, but in 2020, I did have um, spinal surgery that knocked me off my feet. In fact, I'm still not back on my feet entirely. So that's one thing that was going on before I ever, before COVID ever came into my personal life. But I ended up homeless during that year as well which put me in a veteran's homeless shelter where hygienic conditions were questionable. I didn't catch it while I was there. And after I was out of there for 10 months, I had an episode where I stopped drinking and ended up in the hospital as a result of it. Uh, and I was told while I was in the hospital that I contracted COVID but I was never told that I was being treated for COVID. 
uh, I was in the hospital for 10 days. And uh, wow. as a veteran, I get I get uh, a quarterly nurse practitioner meeting. Um, and I had initially at the beginning of COVID when I was, uh, once I got into the housing situation, I got the initial jab and I got a booster. And I didn't notice anything particular from any of it. Um, but in the last few months, and that, that was the last time I got a booster. So I didn't get any additional uh, vaccinations or any additional boosters, somewhat because of information I've been getting from personal friends as well as some of the media, uh, not mainstream media. Um, so I really don't know whether I've ever had COVID, whether I have long COVID. Um, maybe you can help me uh, discern whether I actually have long COVID or not. Um, uh, I've been in an isolated situation and I've been in an isolated situation even before COVID. Um, and other than that 10 months in the housing shelter, I have, I'm living in an isolated situation now, which is well, Thomas, I just got to say, you know, Thomas, thank you for calling. And you have been through a long journey. I'm so happy to hear that you've got housing. That That's the best thing for your health, for sure. And check out that website, longcovidjustice.org. They might be able to tell you a little more about what the symptoms of long COVID are, and you can kind of check out what's going on for you. But I got one question. Are you... No, wait, before I do that, let me give this, the number out for other people. Again, it's 510-848-4425. Now, what 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 do you do in your daily life? Do you go outside? Do you go shopping? Do you wear a mask? How how safe do you feel? Um, well, <laughs> as a black Amer as a black somewhat American, I don't feel safe at all. Um, but as far as the COVID business is concerned, right uh, leave that we've been lied to on a variety of levels about it. So I don't feel like it's wise to feel safe even though I don't want to be paranoid either. So I live in a state of question mark um, and I've got one or two friends that are actually in the professional field, medical field, that swear by the fact that, you know, something was in the jab that uh, they call it calamari-like substance in, in the blood uh, that, you know, is the result of it. Um, and that they are strong proponents for not getting vaccinated and well as some other uh, products that you can use to maybe lessen the effects of the jab. Um, so, you know, I'm going to, oh, so I get out, I do all my shopping by curbside pickup. Um, I don't wear a mask because I'm sitting in my car and I really don't usually have to interact with the person putting the stuff in my trunk. Um, and that's about maybe once every 15 days that I get out for that. Um, other than that, that's really my social outing. I don't have any friends locally because it's the new environment that I moved into. So, you know, I'm very isolated and uh, I feel like that's in my favor, but I don't feel safe. Yeah, it's, it is obviously a safer health-wise but mental health, it's, it brings its own set of rules. So I'm glad you were able to call in. I'm really glad to hear your voice today. And I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. I'm, I'm on that uh, website, Long COVID Justice. All right. You're right on, right on, Thomas. Well, Adrian, what happened when you were in the emergency room? What did they tell you about being vaccinated? Well, they all said that I probably would have died without vaccination and, and boosting. So, you know, I have very compromised lungs, and I'm at deep risk for that. I know there's a lot of information out there. I will go back to what Toddy said and take care of yourself. Drink the water, eat good food, try to get good information. And I, I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm not going to try to give um, advice. 
but I do think that we need to talk about masks and public transit in particular. Uh, this April, no, this March, the Disability Rights California opposed the California Department of Public Health's updated guidance, which ended the mask requirements in healthcare, long-term care, and other high-risk settings. And they said that this was uh, going a step backward for health e equity in California. Now, we just got uh, 10 minutes here. So if you have some thoughts and, and ideas, we really want to get you on the air. 510-848-4425. This program, it goes fast. So call this number, 510-848-4425. So uh, this was a letter that California, Disability Rights California wrote to the California Public Health Officer in March. Obviously, it did no good. There was a lot of push about a year ago at this time from activists and allies saying this mass mandates need to stay because even if everyone is doing okay with these kind of flu-like lightweight coronavirus, for those of us with, who are immunocompromised, it still remains a death sentence. And so there's, there's a lot of information out. And uh, I'm going to read you this thing that uh, a young woman, Hannah Sullivan Frecknitz, wrote in Teen Vogue. I was not on an aircraft when the mandate was lifted, so I cannot speak firsthand to that terror of thinking that you're somewhere safe, only to watch that evaporate to gleeful shouts at, at 30,000 feet. I can only imagine it from my disabled body, a task made easier by the cheer with which COVID measures that put disabled people at further risk were met. I may never be able to enter an aircraft again, at least not in the near future. So this is what we're going through out here. It may seem, I mean, of course we're happy that there is less chance of people getting COVID and, and less, less hospitalizations, less suffering. But if we don't protect each other, if we don't protect the most vulnerable among us, what kind of a society is this? Here's our number again, 510-848-4425. I know a lot of you have been through this one way or another, whether you've gotten COVID or not gotten COVID, but if you live with a disability, this has hit you in a different way than it has other people. So we want to hear from you, 510-848-4425. Well, I got to say that um, for myself, uh, when I found out I had it, the information I got from from non Kaiser, <laughs> the best information was to hydrate. So I set aside a gallon of water. That was my my goal to reach every day to drink that gallon, and um, and I I have been doing that. I have been drinking hydrating, uh, sucking on cough drops. I didn't get the Paxlovid, so I don't have that metal mouth. Apparently, that's what happens when you take Paxlovid. You get a metallic taste in your mouth, but I don't have that because I just wasn't going to play with Kaiser anymore. I went home. I put all my, put all my meds in a bag and said, I'm out of here. And, um, so I'm sucking on cough drops, drinking lots of water, trying to eat healthy and uh, stay out of trouble, keep a mask on outside. I don't have a fever anymore. Uh, it, it really was like kind of a bad cold. And we have Michael from Alameda County. Welcome, Michael. Tell us a little bit about your disability and how COVID has come down in your life. Well, my disability is uh, simply that I'm not really disabled. I'm uh, pushing closer to 80 than 70 at this point. So in a sense, that's kind of a disability. It just makes me more vulnerable. But um, my recommendation is going through this, uh, you know, downturn with people just sort of walking away from all the preparations that had to be made kind of on the fly, you know, three or four years ago, that uh, 
we really see this as a warning that we have to, uh, you know, facing potential disasters and a bunch of other stuff that's coming down, um, we have to keep stockpiling the, the basic needs and realize that uh, just the basics of having water available and all that um, in a to-go bag, if something else happens, um, and you do have to present yourself back into the public. Um, I fortunately didn't come down with anything, although I do have uh, nothing symptomatic, but I did suffer from some fatigue in the early um, years of this thing, and also wondering if that had any effect on my loss of sense of smell, because uh, that was one of the um, caveats. However, uh, it could be just my aging out as well. So, um, but I'm, I've had all my shots, and I'm trying to stay as um, you know aware as possible. But I just see that it's uh, just societally we have to be a little more careful about just the the hubris that we've developed. That oh, we got all these shots now, we can just you know fly freely in the face of the next one. I just think we just need to be better prepared and keep that information. It was really, it was a spotlight that we really should have paid attention to and continue to pay attention to that, especially for people who are disabled or have some, you know, differently abled situation where, um, you know, we have to take care of them first and then we'll know how to take care of everybody yeah, else. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're making really good advice and I'm going to move on because we're trying to get a few more people in here. Um, but thank you, Roger from El Cerrito. Welcome to Pushing Links. Hello. Tell us about your disability Hi. and what COVID has been like for you. Hi. Okay. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say I'm terribly sorry that you're ill, and I'm very happy to hear that you're on the mend. I know this is a very big challenge for everybody. I, I've been fighting and worrying about this thing since the beginning. I was terrified as soon as I heard the information and the science on the whole thing. I got really worried. I uh, have several comorbidities. Uh, I, at the time, I was very much more overweight than I am now. I have sleep apnea. I have a, a high blood pressure, um, aging. And all those comorbidities had me like, uh oh, I'm so Roger, candy. I hate to yeah. say this, but we've got one minute. So give us your takeaway, would okay. you? All right, I will. Okay, I want to say that everybody out there should wear their masks. And I'll tell you my experience for the last three years, I've never had one cold, not one flu, not one sneezing, not one anything uh, respiratory and I'm thankful that I have a mask I will continue wearing it even after wow. COVID because of the fact it protects me so well right on Roger right on and and uh, let me just say that uh, Kaiser doesn't pay for tests anymore so you got to put your money out and get your tests ready I mean Michael was right. We need to have all of our ducks in a row, and we're we're in the pond by ourselves. And hopefully, you know, maybe you have a friend to you can grab wings with and have COVID together. It's a lot <laughs> nicer to have with somebody else, because we don't have to wear masks. If I made Adrian sick, well, that's you know that's not nice. Thank you everybody for participating. Thank you, Rod Akeel at the at the helm. Uh, you're awesome. And thanks, all you listeners. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. The intelligence of KPFA is not artificial. It is real. It's created by talented people from our community and supported by our community. When you donate to KPFA, you are giving to our righteous idea of being community powered. Now, that's real. That's why we are here, as vigilant as always. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA. 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley. KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno. 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz. And online worldwide. Worldwide. Worldwide at kpfa.org. Mm -hmm. 